friends and I created a weight loss challenge with weekly weigh-ins and $50 on the line each week. On the first day of the challenge, I woke up early, worked out, ate a tiny breakfast, and went to work, where I saw a sign in the break room saying there was a blood drive happening that day. Now, I would like to tell you that I signed up to give blood because I'm a good person, but did you know there are 650 calories in just one pint of blood? <laughs> I'd given blood half a dozen times before in my life and always felt fine, the standard one pint. This time, they asked if I wanted to give a double red blood cell donation because Houston blood banks are running really low. I'm a universal donor. My blood is more sought after than yours. It's not my fault. <laughs> I, some things I didn't know at the time that I would come to learn in the coming uh, hours and days. The average adult body has 10 pints of blood in it. This donation removes two pints of blood, spins the red blood cells out for them to keep, mixes the remaining byproduct with a saline solution and shoves it back into my body. And then that happens again, hence the double red blood cell donation. So when all is said and done, they have removed four of the 10 pints of blood from my body, depleted that blood of red blood cells, and replaced it with what is essentially contact lens solution. <laughs> they removed the needle from my arm. I put my arm over my head for 60 seconds and they said, you're good, you can go. I didn't get up immediately, I thought there was more to it. They said, no, you're good, you go. Turns out these vampires wanted the chair I was in for more blood donations. But they said I was fine, so I walked up a flight of stairs and down a long hallway back to my office. On that walk, I started feeling hot and faint and seeing black spots. I got to my desk chair and sat down exhausted. The black spots were taking over more of my vision, and I was finding it hard to catch my breath. I knew I needed help. I picked up the phone and tried to dial the four-digit extension to my secretary, a number I used to know by heart, but now my fingers clumsily bashed the keys and my brain could not remember the number. My office was in a corner, and you couldn't see my desk from the hallway, so I was pretty sure if I passed out in there, no one would find me for a while. So I decided to stand up, walk to the office next door, tell them I had just given blood and didn't feel well. That was the plan, at least. I barely made it out into the hallway before my body went stiff and I fell like a tree straight backwards. The sound of my head hitting the ground could be heard by the entire floor. Everyone came running from their offices to find me sprawled unconscious on the ground with my head cracked open. Panic ensued. But to me, it felt like the most peaceful, deep sleep. <laughs> the kind of sleep where you drool all over the pillow, the kind of sleep where you're having a good dream and you hear your alarm clock, but you will yourself not to wake up. I could hear, so I was unconscious, but I could hear someone calling my name over and over again, and I couldn't make myself move. When I finally regained consciousness, there were seven or eight people standing around me, and 911 had already been called. The first order of business was to dispel the rumor that I was having a seizure, which I understand my body was seizing uncontrollably because my blood sugar was so low, my eyes were rolling back in my head, and my long sleeve dress was hiding the bandage from the blood drive. One of the people standing over me was the managing partner of the firm, which is the boss of all bosses. And he, at this point, no one knew that I'd given blood. And so he looked down at me and he said, what happened? And I said, Bob. I gave too much blood. Should have kept more for myself. I was trying to keep it lighthearted because I'd been at this job less than a year and I didn't want to be noticed at all, let alone for being sprawled unconscious on the hallway. When I passed out, I fell out of my shoes like a cartoon character, <laughs> leaving them standing neatly side by side <laughs> a few feet away from my body. My knee length flowy dress had billowed up over my upper thighs, exposing me and my underwear to a crowd of coworkers, bosses, secretaries, and summer interns. One of those interns was standing over me in total shock. Are these your glasses? He asked me, and I looked up, and I nodded. Whoa. <laughs> these were like 10 feet behind you. 
Two sets of paramedics from two different fire stations came to my aid. In the fire world, that's a two alarm fire. The first set of paramedics came and they fed me a tube of lemon flavored glucose paste for my blood sugar and determined that one, my neck was not broken and two, my brain was not bleeding. All great news. The second set of paramedics came with an EKG machine to check my heart. They helped me sit up and the room started spinning and I thought I was going to throw up. The more concerning sensation, however, was the feeling that my bra was no longer on. Everyone was still gathered around watching me eat glucose paste, so I motioned for my secretary to come closer and I whispered, did somebody remove my bra while I was <laughs> unconscious? She looked horrified. She, this was her cue to clear the hallway and send everyone back to their offices. No, she told me, no one touched your breast while you were passed out. <laughs> also great news. The sheer force of my fall was just too much for my bra. It was not simply unhooked. It had ripped through fabric and underwire straight down the middle, and it now hung uselessly under my V-neck dress, and I was coming dangerously close to a nip slip in front of a bunch of old men at work. The paramedic holding the EKG machine, the only cute firefighter of the eight who came to my aid, announced that I needed to remove my shirt so he could perform the EKG. Someone wisely advised me not do that in the middle of the hallway, but I was still too nauseous to stand up and walk to my office, so he put his arms underneath my armpits and dragged me backwards across the carpet, <laughs> down the hallway, into my office. Real dignified-like. <laughs> Once we're in there, he said, you can keep your bra on, just put the stickers on your chest, your back, and your stomach. I said, well, it must be your lucky day. <laughs> as I removed my dress and made a futile attempt to repair my bra with the binder clip. He laughed uncomfortably. <laughs> so there I sat, barefoot, bare-breasted, on the floor of my office, the office I coveted for three long years of law school, holding my boobs in my hands and trying to suck it in while a cute firefighter put stickers on my boobs and tried not to smirk. Thankfully, nothing life-threatening had happened, so I didn't have to go in the ambulance with them. Um, they sent me home to rest, and I, my pain and nausea and confusion kind of got worse throughout the day. And I never had a head injury before. I didn't want to take any chances. So I called a childhood friend of mine, who is now a paramedic and firefighter, to ask his advice. Told him the whole story, and he laughed. Oh, my God, that was you? <laughs> The guys have been talking about that all day. As luck would have it, he worked at one of those two fire stations, and that story had spread like wildfire. It also spread around my office and has become somewhat of a legend. I don't even work there anymore, and that story still gets told every time there's a blood drive. And that's fine. I mean, initially, it was, took a lot of guts to share this embarrassing story with anyone, let alone on a stage, but now I love telling this story because it's embarrassing it's more vulnerable, it's more relatable. Um, and I love the different reactions this gets from the audience. I love, you know, when you laugh at me for being such an idiot, for trying to lose weight by giving blood, I love that. Um, <laughs> or when you gasp and you hear how much blood I gave. One time someone shouted from the audience, no! <laughs> Where was he before? And then when you grow uncomfortable and silent and embarrassed for me when my bra breaks at work. And these kind of reactions epitomize for me the power of storytelling. Everyone has stories, and these stories are what connects us to each other as humans. And it gives us a glimpse into the lives of another, someone whose experiences we haven't lived. It feels like today our world is more and more divided, more us versus them, each side retreating farther and farther into our own worlds, surrounding ourselves with an echo chamber of people who look like us, think like us, speak, vote, pray like us. What we seem to have forgotten is the ability to empathize with experiences we've never lived through and with people we've never met. But through stories, you can glimpse into another world, and I think we need to do that now more than ever. And it's not always easy. Sometimes it takes guts to tell a vulnerable story, or sometimes it takes blood. Four, four pine glasses full of blood. <laughs> but I challenge you this week, 
because it, it is within stories you find, just like in blood and guts, the elements of our common humanity. So I challenge you this week, talk to someone whose life is different than yours. Listen to their story, share a story of your world with them, and just be humans together. <laughs>